You're listening to the Native Plants Healthy Planet Podcast, presented by Pinelands Nursery. Here are your hosts, Fran Chismar and Tom Knezic. Welcome back to the bro. All right. You got to leave that in. No, I'm not leaving that in. <laughs> it was it was on the first line. All right. <laughs> All right. I'm I'm going to let it go till it's at 1 minute and then I'm going to just do it at that point. Just give me a sec. So. Welcome back to the Buzz brought to you by the Native Plants Healthy Planet podcast presented by Pinelands Nursery. I am Fran Chismar. And I'm Tom Knezic and today we are having a spooky edition of the Buzz. Uh, and this is episode 77. I have so. spooky music queued up. You want to hear it? Yes, please. All right. Oh, maybe. <laughs> <That's>... <laughs> I'm... How's that? The silence was <laughs> was very spooky. <laughs> <laughs> I flubbed the first, like the intro. I didn't even get to the third word yeah. and we had to start over this twice. This is now the blues. Yeah, uh... the blues. <laughs> yeah, welcome to the blues. <laughs> but no, we have a, a lot of really... Um... Well, all our normal segments, but I at least I tried to put a little bit of a Halloween spin, at least on our topic, yeah. because uh, many of you are going to be listening to this on either October 29th, 30th, or 31st, which is Halloween. I have to give uh, Alyssa Lewis uh, credit for making the suggestion for for our topic today, and plus, uh, as a surprise, her family helped me with a surprise for later in the episode, so I want to make sure I, I throw credit their way. So I don't forget when it happens. Yeah, but we have a lot of things lined up for you today, like the plants that we're vibing with this week. Oh, let's see what else. We have our articles with this or that. Yeah. Uh, I have a, a new book report. I have coming no, up. I have no complaints. That's hard to believe. I I, you'll you'll find that. something <laughs> along the way. And then at the end of the episode, if you stick around, you know, on the buzz, we share a little bit of a secret. So yeah, yeah. one of we, us is going to be sharing a secret. We, and and there is a, a call on the, the and, question yeah, and we comment have a, line. A question um, that we haven't got one in a while. And now we have mm. one that Fran... It's a surprise. It's a surprise. <laughs> yeah, I didn't. I didn't share that with Tom either. There's a bunch of surprises this episode, so yeah. we're. Uh, it, it's going to yeah. be a fun, loaded episode. Oh yeah, but let's start with the plants we're vibing with this week in a feature called "That's Hot." Hot. Would you like to go first, or would yeah, you like I can it? go first. Okay. Um, I've actually mentioned this plant as one of my favorite fall plants. Now that I'm seeing what you're choosing, I thought you had done this one already. Did I really? I don't I, think it did. I, I think, think it's just that you've mentioned it. I think times. I mentioned it a lot. Someone, I don't think I've done it. One of our guests did. Okay. That's, that's true. Name. That that is what it was. And um and but my plant that I love this time of year is uh and it's really it holds on this leaf for a long time. Um so I could use this again in probably another two weeks, but I'm not gonna I'm gonna use it today. And that is uh liquid ambar styrachiflua. Did I say it right? Styrasiflua. Styrasiflua. There you go. I always that's mess fun. up the second word, but which is uh sweet gum. And a lot of people don't like sweet gum, and uh, for a decent reason. They can be very messy trees as they far as be. trees go. And um, there's what a lot of people know is uh, those like spiky balls that fall down mm. in in a little bit later in the year. That comes from a sweet gum, and uh, and I had a really good or bad experience with a sweet gum ball where I was parked at my friend's driveway. I had a broken foot and it was the first day I got my walking boot off and I stepped on one oh. and re broke my foot. So yeah, I can understand why people don't like them. But um, And yet you still chose it as your that's hot. It's my that's hot tree because this time of year uh, they are just like lighting up um, kind of painting the neck to lists on our our website for fall color because yeah. they're like every fall color it is they're... and that's what's beautiful you get yellow orange and red all on the mm -hmm. same tree there's leaves that look almost like pinkish there's some that are that are really just like neon red there's some that are like a deep dark purple or crimson um there's some leaves that almost look black and those leaves will actually change too it's it's um you'll uh, just walking through the nursery to that block there's some leaves that oh yesterday they were yellow now they're a little bit more orange they're getting like like bloody red tones to them as yeah. well it's really really cool how that tree looks this time of year i agree and um and there's one tree i i uh when i go deer hunting i hunt near it and i just love looking at this tree i'm looking at this tree more than i'm looking for <laughs> for animals 
but uh yeah it's just a really beautiful tree gets pretty big um i tend to see it in wetter areas but i notice it's, it's a, a facultative species so it's not a species that really needs to be in wet areas and then i guess the, the other part of that is well it can be inundated for part of the year mm-hmm. and then be dry for part of the year too so um a from a habitat management standpoint, if you're looking to to, it's not something that gives back to um, to traditional game or, or that mm-hmm. kind of wildlife as much. So, and and there can be very prolific. You can get a lot of these trees really really tight together. Yes. And uh, so, if you're managing for better habitat, it is often advantageous to thin these out, leave a handful because they do benefit other species. But um, but you don't need a whole 10 acres of this species, no, which is I, what can happen. And, they can really take over. And I think that's why it gets a little bit of a bad name because it's fast growing. You do get a lot of breakage, kind of like silver maple. Uh, you get that quick, fast growth. Um, you know, the spiky balls, like you mm-hmm. mentioned, that, that they can be a little bit more aggressive. But as far as adaptability and getting something established quickly and having success, mm-hmm. I mean, that's a great plan. And the fall color is phenomenal. Yeah. So I, I agree with you 100%. That's a great choice. It's... um. I don't know. Yeah. I really, it's I not, really like that. It's one. not something, something I'd necessarily recommend that. Oh, you need to plant this in your landscape because it is going to be messy. You are going to have these those little spiky balls, which are the the seed heads, all over the place. Yeah. But as far as a tree that in a wild area we can look really, really beautiful. Oh, it's it's and really nice. Take multiple conditions, mm-hmm. you know. And like I said, if you want to be successful with a native plant, you're going to be successful yeah. with that one. It's kind of hard not to be. That's a that's a great choice. Yeah, Fran, what do you have this week? So I know I've mentioned mine before too, um, and it's possum hall viburnum. Not to be confused with possum hall, which is also a holly, possum hall holly, uh, but viburnum nudum. Um, and possum hall actually like cas- uh, wild raisin, which is viburnum nudum casanoides, is mm-hmm. kind of like a subspecies of gotcha. a possum hall. But mid-sized shrub swamps uh, can take it on the wetter side. Of the inner and outer coastal, coastal plain, uh, for viburnum it has a glossy leaf, like glossy mm-hmm. green leaf that turns uh, like a really nice brilliant red in the fall, mm-hmm. and then the fruit turns from pink to lavender to blue, like a dark blue. So you get kind of get like this white early berry that slowly turns pinkish, like mm-hmm. it's and big clusters, like enough to like really bend and arch the branches down. So you you kind of get like this really good prolific berry set. Um, and and it's a good winter food source uh, yeah. for for birds. So it's I don't know. It's one of those ones. It gets I like it's an obligate, so it can take really wet conditions, mm-hmm. but it doesn't have to be planted in wet conditions. And it only gets six to eight foot tall. So if you yeah. want like a good mid sized shrub, you know, for mm-hmm. your property, it's a great choice. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, I, good good choice. I've been oh yeah that that's in full glory right now. Fruit. So I've been walking mm-hmm. by the ones by our pond, taking photos of them, and they're. It, it's outstanding, so I can't get enough of that one. Yeah, but they're two species that are really – we try and highlight the things that are looking really good, and those are two that are looking really, really good, especially as it comes to, to yeah. what ha- what looks good in the fall. You know, the one thing I just thought of, too, for your choice with sweet gum is that even in the winter, it does get like a winged bark on the branches, yeah. So, oh, yeah. um, which is very unique. It gets almost like a whitish mm-hmm. wing on, on not all the branches. It's It's not – consistent it's inconsistent but it just gives you a really interesting it's got really interesting branching yes. angles oh yeah so it's and, for and fall it's, interest um, or i mean winter where i feel like i might have, I, this would be really embarrassing if i used this like a month ago <laughs> but uh because i feel like i use this reference on the podcast before but the leaves always look like for people who've seen the land before time when they talk about tree stars that's what yeah. i envision with a, a tree star totally leaf it, it's a really just cool plant Totally, totally. Great choices. All right, but We're, we got to keep it moving. We got oh yeah, we back. got a lot to, to cover. Um, this could easily be a two-hour episode if we let it go. Oh, totally, totally. <laughs> but, uh, moving along, let's get into this week's botany-based current events. Of course, we always make it a competition. Let's move along to this or that. So I had to check because this one kept going back and forth, and it, it did, was yeah. really close. But we, because it is a competition, we do have a winner. I won this one 14 to 10. And like, Fran, do you remember what your article was? I don't remember. Uh, <laughs> wow. Um, I can pull it up here in just a moment. No, I I don't. 
Uh, Your was article it? Oh, was so good no, that you didn't. My article was <laughs> uh, my article was about the in Kansas City. Yes, the, you you did. The, you the had to go order. wild without getting sued, which was yes. in the Madison Park Times by Erica Graves. Yeah, and that was a, actually that was a really good article that I saw making the rounds on a lot of these native plant groups, um, and uh, it's inspiring because it shows that hey, maybe you can do this. And my article, the losing article, was from a, a rag paper. Um, called the Smithsonian Magazine, <laughs> and, and that was about uh, the American bumblebee has vanished from eight U.S. states. Yeah, and, which uh, which is important news. It's an important study. Yeah, oh, to, yeah, to do. And I really actually I really enjoyed your article. I had a lot of questions after after reading it. And that's yeah. what you want an article to do. Exactly. You want to pique someone's interest, and yeah. it really piqued my interest. Now, so. I, if we're going based off strategy on um, on what articles would be successful, I would. I shouldn't have picked the article I did this week, but I still picked it because I enjoyed it. You know, I have no idea what article you picked. Um, I don't have a strategy. I really don't. Like, if I start losing, like, three in a row, then I, I look yeah. for— Then it's, we got to go to the well here and yeah. find something that's really appealing, like that last article. <laughs> yeah. yeah, then you start—I'm like, did Margaret Roach have a new <laughs> article <laughs> this week? But uh, I'm I'm actually going to go first, and I think mine's a little different— um, I, I'd say it's a little different this time um, from what I, I typically pick, I think. But it's called Flies Like Yellow, Bees Like Blue, How Flower Color Catered to the Taste of Pollinating Insects. And it's by Jer Garcia, Adrian Dyer, Manny Shrestha, uh, and it's from the converse, conversation on fizz.org. So again, like always, I'm going to – I probably highlighted way too much of the article that I'm going to read through, and then I'll start paraphrasing a little bit just so you get an idea of, of what they're trying to convey and accomplish. But we all know the birds and the bees are important for pollination, and we often notice them in gardens and parks. But what about flies? Flies are the second most common type of pollinator, so perhaps we should all be taught about the bees, the flies, and the birds. While we know animals may see colors differently, little was known about fly pollination shapes and the types of flowers we can find in nature. In our new study, we address the gap in our knowledge by evaluating how important fly pollinators sense and use color and how fly pollinated flowers have evolved color signals. Uh, we know that different humans often have preferences for certain colors, and in a similar way, bees prefer blue hues. Our colleague Lee Hanna has observed, however, uh, that hoverflies are much better at at distinguishing between different shades of yellow than between different blues. Other research has also reported hoverflies have innate responses to yellow color. Uh, many flowering plants depend on attracting pollinators to reproduce, so the appearance of other flowers has evolved to cater to the preference of the pollinators. We wanted to find out what this might mean for how different insects like bees or flies shape flower colors in a complex natural environment where both types of insects are present. Since we know different animals sense colors in different ways, we recorded the spectrum in different wavelengths of light reflected from flowers with a spectrometer. We subsequently modeled the spectral signatures of plant flowers considering animal perception, allowing us to objectively quantify how signals have evolved. These analyses included mapping the evolutionary ancestries of the plants. I just want to give myself credit for pronouncing all those words without <laughs> loving them. <Yeah. laughs> According to one school of thought, flower evolution is driven by competition between flowering plants. In this scenario, different species might have very different colors from one to another to increase their chances of being reliably identified and pollinated. This is a bit how exclusive brands seek customers by having readily identifiable brands. Um, I'm, I'm almost done here. An alternate hypothesis to competition is facilitation. Plants may share preferred color signals to attract higher number of specific insects. This explanation is how some competing businesses can do better by being physically close together to attract many customers. Our results demonstrate how flower color signaling has dynamically evolved depending on the availability of insect pollinators as happens in marketplaces. When both fly and bee pollinators are present, flowers pollinated by flies appear to filter out bees to reduce the number of ineffective and opportunistic visitors. For example, in the Himalayas, specialized plants require require flies with long tongues to access floral rewards. This is similar to a store that wants to exclusively attract customers specifically interested in their product range. Our findings on fly color vision, along with novel precision agriculture techniques, uh, can help using flies as an alternative pollinator of crops. It also allows us to understand that if we see a full range of pollinating insects, including beautiful hoverflies in our parks and gardens, we need to plant a range of flower types and colors. So 
I, I wanted to get into the science of how they they were making that distinguish it, not just saying they were making distinguishments. So mm -hmm. I, I kind of went a little bit more in depth, but I don't think enough gets focused on flies as far as pollinators. You hear bees, you hear butterflies, you hear all these other mm -hmm. things. But if if flies are the second biggest pollinator, and it's, I find it interesting how we, we kind of had a similar conversation this morning about how plants may yeah. Oh, yeah. may do different things to attract certain certain visitors mm -hmm. to, to accomplish survival. So I, I just find that interesting that we probably don't pay enough attention to the flies, and we, we kind of view them as a nuisance. Mm -hmm. um, they, they really get a bad rap because yeah. of – a handful of flies you have house flies you have cluster flies and um and the the uh what are they called the big horse flies that and then whatever yeah. the thing is that when you're in the pool the thing that like the size of a <laughs> ufo that's flying around your head <laughs> trying to bite you yeah, yeah those they give you they give flies a bad yeah. rap but yeah. there are so many different kinds of flies many of which don't pay any attention to humans or our spaces that are doing so much pollination yeah. and uh, some that look like don't when you it was one of the apps that we focused on a couple weeks or a couple months ago now. I can't remember what it was called. I have it on my phone. I'll look it up. But there was like a bee identification and it would say, is this a bee or a fly? And there's so many flies that look like bees, but people just look at them and say. And that's because and, and, and not only that, it's how important flies are to the food web, too. When you think of all the things that feed on flies, um, you know, spiders, uh, frogs, that type of thing, amphibians, it, it's important in in. In multi-dimensional ways, not just as part of the food food web, but also as far as our pollination goes. And it's when we're spraying uh, just mass chemicals, that's part of what suffers and and hurts the food web as well. So it's I you know I'm not starting a crusade to save the fly, but it's just interesting that not only is this showing their importance, but just how evolved plants have become to attract you know. <laughs> different colors for different pollinators, mm -hmm. which yeah. I, oh, yeah. which is amazing to me. It's just a whole nother level of, of, of plant interaction that kind of used to go over my head mm -hmm. that I, I kind of oh, yeah. pay a little bit more attention to. Now. So the app I mentioned is uh, Lawns the Wildflowers, and they have a pollinator ID game. And um, I talked about this a bunch of episodes ago on a buzz because I had an article that was about this app. But uh, they have pollinate ID game is like butterfly versus wasp, honeybee versus bumblebee. Okay, those are two are pretty easy. But then it starts getting into honeybee versus bumblebees versus other kinds of bees, flies versus honeybees. That's probably pretty easy. And then uh, beetle versus bumblebees. It kind of breaks down so you can start to identify and realize how close and similar some of these things look. You think, oh, a beetle versus a bumblebee, big difference. Oh, well, sometimes things look a little bit closer than than you think. But um, no, flies are awesome. Uh, America's forgotten fruit, the pawpaw, yeah. is is fly pollinated, and the flowers uh, try and smell like raw rotting meat. <laughs> so, <laughs> Yum. There's a lot of things. Yeah. I think there's an orchid that does the same thing. Yeah. It has like a, a incredibly bad fragrance to attract flies. To attract flies, pollinate. which which makes perfect sense. So it's 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 not just the science of it; it's the acknowledgement of the flies, the the incredible amount that plants have evolved to adapt. Mm -hmm. um, you, you know, all of it together, and the importance of the food web is just to me. It, it was significant enough to mm -hmm. to choose as my article. Yeah. But what do you got this week? So mine uh, is is remarkably similar to my last article, Our, and that's ooh. endangered bumblebee is blocking Rockford Airport expansion that would destroy rare par prairie, but only for another week. And so, that was at the time this article was published. All right. So <laughs> at the time that that you're you're listening to me talk about this. Um, it may be too late. It's, uh, <laughs> so it's bumblebees versus flies this week. Bumblebees versus flies. It's yeah. almost like rock, paper, scissors. We need to come out with like a, <laughs> an insects-based rock, paper, scissors. Yeah. So now this was um, was an article in the Chicago Tribune, and that was published on uh, October 22nd uh, by Cheryl DeVore. And uh, I'll read a little bit, and then I'll get into my thoughts as well. So a federally endangered bumblebee has temporarily saved one of the state's rarest prairies from the bulldozer, but only until November 1st. So if you're listening before November 1st, you have time to get involved. If you're listening to this after, uh, then still reach out, but you, it might be too late. <laughs> so meanwhile, biologists and conservationists are working to convince the prairie's owner, the Chicago Rockford International Airport, to change its plans for 
a roughly 280-acre expansion that would go through the heart of the Bell Bowl Prairie in Winnebago County. Side note, have you ever seen the Winnebago Man viral video? Yes. That was like one of the first viral videos. Yes. There was a documentary about that. That was You that actually was turned really, me really on fun. to that because they were saying yeah. that his viral videos are what made YouTube. Yeah. Like yeah. they were that the was first like, viral. It, was, it started out as a, 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 um, a VCR that someone mm-hmm. had uh, like stolen the tape from the, the production company. And then it was like copied so many times through VCR and then brought to parties and played. Parties. If you haven't if you look seen up it, look Winnebago it up. Man, it's it's uh, don't watch it with your children. Yes, it's no, incredibly it's, crude. It's not family <laughs> family <laughs> friendly. Funny. Sidebar: um, This five acre virgin gravel prairie is part of only eighteen point four acres of this type of prairie left in the state, according to the Inter- Illinois Natural Areas Inventory. Bell Bowl Prairie contains at least 164 species of plants, many of which are rare, and birders have found rare nesting birds such as the grasshopper sparrow. Uh, a remnant of America's past landscape, the prairie has, saved, has been saved several times since the 1960s by George Fell, founded the Natural Areas Movement and conservation organizations like the Land Institute and the Nature Conservancy. Uh, a U.S. Army training camp during World War I and World War II, um, most of Bell Bowl was, was not disturbed by grazing or plowing, uh, that makes it a remnant prairie of which less than one hundredth of one percent remains in Illinois, according to White's paper. Terry Lee said the Land Institute and other environmental organizations were not aware of the expansion plans at the airport initiated two years ago. They only discovered the plans after someone saw an area near the prairie being bulldozed this summer. He said a short time later, an employee with the Illinois Department of Natural Resources discovered the rusty patch bumblebee foraging there. In his email statement, Oakley said the airport agreed to pause all work in the affected area until November 1st, uh, 2021, when the bumblebee or when the bee foraging season is over. Uh, airport officials have recently acknowledged the presence of rare plants on the prairie. The airport has also voluntarily begun working with IDNR on a field survey and relocation of the two state endangered species, which is the large flowered beard tongue and the prairie dandelion. Um, the airport also agreed to allow IDNR to remove these specific plants prior to commencing construction. Oakley said in the statement, but state botanist Paul Markham said moving a few plants is not going to save the prairie, an intact ecosystem that also needs the species to survive. This article went on quite a bit longer, but it kind of, it shows what's going on here and how, um, how difficult it is to manage these things. An airport expansion is definitely going to help the airport. It's definitely going to help people in the Chicago, Rockford area travel. Um, but you're losing a part of our natural history in that process, a part that not very much remains. You're not going to get it back. And and I don't yeah. think that relocating – I mean we know a lot of the times plants are rare because they need specific conditions. So mm-hmm. relocating them doesn't necessarily guarantee their success. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, And that's kind of what some more of the article went on to say is like relocating the plants isn't going to save the prairie. You might save a few plants, but that's not an ecosystem. Yeah. Um, they talk about how, well, yeah, okay, the bee foraging season's over, but and then you bulldoze the area. Well, a lot of these bees are nesting underground, and now they're they're destroyed in that process. And if they happen to not be destroyed, well, the ecosystem they need to survive is destroyed. So just because oh the bee foraging season is over, it doesn't mean they go away. They're just they're going into the ground. Yeah. Right by those plants. So. It's um, yeah, it's a, a pretty tragic thing, and, and I know Southeastern Grasslands Initiative talks a lot about what's going on in the South and how they're trying to save a lot of these remnant prairies from road expansions, from mowing, from uh, all kinds of development. There's not a lot of this left, and um, and unless we step up and try and prevent it, then it, it's going to continue to happen. Now, devil's advocate from the airport side of things, it's like, well, I own this property. Why? Why didn't you? Yeah, I should be able to do with it. I've been working on this for two years. Why? Why can't I do what I want? So, yeah, yeah, it's a a tricky, tricky situation there. But you get enough people involved, sometimes you can you can put a stop to this kind of stuff. And it's you know at least they're making some some. they're, uh, they're, would, yeah, they're making the concessions. Thank you. I yeah. couldn't think of the word. They're making some concessions. They're allowing them to get in there and do some work and 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 so forth. Is it enough? No, not really. You know, and I I understand. You know, at some point, forward progress is ruining our forward progress, mm-hmm. and it's yeah. you know, it, it's just hard to see. Yeah. Um. I don't know. It's. <laughs> 
I, I can't remember the exact quote from this article. I'll, I'll have to find it. But there was someone who, he had a couple of really good quotes in this article. I'm thinking about it. But it was like something along the lines of, this is like lighting something on fire and roasting marshmallows on it. And, uh, but it, it kind of reminds me of, in, in uh, a little bit, how, okay, yeah, this is, like I said, it's their property. They can do what they want it, to some extent. Uh, talking about the airport but we've kind of seen with that prairie that there's only 18.4 acres of it left in the entire state and five of them are about to be destroyed in this mm-hmm. this build up it reminds me of like when you're a kid and you're throwing rocks in a pond and then it's like well if everyone threw a rock in that pond would eventually yeah. fill in if you, well, everyone's throwing rocks in so it's like someone has to not throw the rock in well, and hope others don't well, as well. Here's the funny thing. It's it's plants and it's rare plants and rare insects, which to a lot of people does not hold a lot of value. I guarantee you if they were to have found gold. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They'd be like, whoa, we can't build an airport here. You know, we have to, you know, we have to take care of this precious resource. <laughs> the, the, you know, because that's the, what's valuable to people. The quote that I that I um, somewhat found humorous just because of the wording of it was by uh, Randy Nybor. He's a recently retired ecologist with the IDNR, the Illinois Department of Natural Resources and Illinois Natural Histor- er, History Survey. And uh, he said, it's like having a 500-year-old ancient grandfather clock and saying, I'm going to tear this up and throw it in the fireplace so I can roast marshmallows. Yeah. And it yeah. really is. It's something it's, that's been around for centuries. at least a few centuries, if yeah. not thousands of years. And um, and the the soils have obviously been there a lot lot yeah. longer to develop that gravelly soil like they're talking about that is really really special and really rare. So so they're gonna rip yeah. it out, put some uh, impermeable pavement, mm-hmm. you know, and and there you go. So the I know the Natural Land Institute and um, the Nature Conservancy and all the parties in here are trying to propose and say, hey, how can we work around this? Make it something that's special to this airport. Hey, look what we saved. They could be re- really be the heroes of this whole thing by saying, hey, look what we saved by working around it and preserving it. But, you know, having seen this with, with oh, I don't want to say which airport, but a local airport in uh, the New Jersey, New York area, part of their concern having that land there, too, is they don't want birds mm-hmm. because they don't yep. want birds flying into planes causing uh, damage to, yeah. to planes or, or possibly death or accidents. So – um, you know, I'm sure they're trying to limit the amount of land like that around there that can attract birds that, that are going to be an issue. So it's like, it, it's just, I, I don't know what the answer is yeah. because where else do you put an airport? It's not like you're going to knock yeah, up, exactly. you know, you can, you can. No, and in the airport's defense, they weren't doing anything wrong. They're no. following all the guidelines and rules from the FF or FAA, um, local state government, federal rules. They're following all the rules. Yeah. They aren't doing anything illegal. Um, they're doing what some people would consider immoral by destroying this prairie. Uh, but at the end of the day, they probably don't know. They don't recognize no. how special it is. And then at the end of the day, it's like, well, a handful of people think it's special, but how are, the majority probably doesn't even know what it is. So yeah. it's a, uh, yeah, it's a tricky situation. I don't know. I can't blame the airport for, for not no. doing more, No, but, but it's uh, it would be nice to see them do more. Is what you got. But yeah. two great articles. Two great articles. So we appreciate the last couple of weeks um all the votes that everyone's been giving. We've had a great turnout and they've been close. Uh so uh we're gonna have this up Friday afternoon, Friday evening, uh again for you to vote. As and- long as I don't forget. I've, <laughs> I've been known to do that sometimes. <laughs> but it will be up and uh we appreciate everyone uh listening and voting and just make sure that, that you do vote because there can be only one. It is a contest. So in the end, and of course, the choice is yours. All right. So we should probably keep. Yeah. Keep we it, got a couple listener rolling. shout outs this week. We do. Listener, listener, shout out, shout out, shout out, shout out. So, um, Uncle Fat, you know, I was, I was a little bummed because I, I chose mine early on because I thought we'd have so many five star reviews that you would have so much. Uh, legwork to do to to say kind words, and we didn't really get any since, since the last. No, I, well, we got a handful, but they didn't write. They anything, didn't write anything. So. We got five star reviews, but with with no written thing. So I kind of stole an early one from us. But uh, 
uh, my shout out is to Graham King and Graham uh, works at the Mariners Museum in Virginia. He's a customer of ours and a listener. And uh, one of our coworkers begrudgingly shared the, <laughs> the compliment to us. I can I only had, guess which coworker. <laughs> has she been on this podcast? She before? has been on this <laughs> yeah. podcast before. So um, I, Graham had called and I talked to him and I had transferred him to Kelsey because they were scheduling a delivery. And uh, he had mentioned that he's like, oh, I wish I would have said something to Fran when I was on the phone, but I'm a big fan of the podcast and, and I love listening to Tom and Fran. And he went on to say a bunch of really nice things that Kelsey hated telling us. And uh, <laughs> so much so that she didn't tell me at all. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Graham, we appreciate you listening and, and for doing business with us. And uh, we, we just really appreciate it. So we're, we're happy we, I could make you my shout out this week. Yeah. And then my shout out, we just got in a day or two ago. Yeah. And that's um, from Dawn Watts, who's a member of our Native Plants Healthy Planet Facebook group and a podcaster herself. She is a co host of the uh, Regenerative Landscape podcast, which is based out of Alberta, Canada. Yeah. So, so that was, we always like hearing where people are listening from. Uh, and we've mentioned a bunch of times that we've been listening in all 50 states and, and a ton of different countries. Um, but it's nice to hear that people in Canada and, and on the West Coast can get something out of our message because our knowledge base is really limited to the East Coast, but what needs to happen needs to happen worldwide. Yeah. And it's the ideology of it, um, not just the specifics. And it was nice. I, I think for Dawn, it was nice finding us and finding out there are other people like her and her two uh, co-hosts that are having the same ideas and having the same conversations and wanting to spread that word and, and, and make it a, a bigger, a bigger uh, topic of conversation. Yeah. So, but was, I know Fran, you checked out the podcast already. I haven't had a chance yeah. to listen to it yet. I was going to kick it on earlier and then got it into my meetings. And yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to try to listen to another episode on my way home. Today. Yeah. So, so no, I'm interested in checking it out and, and Keep doing what you're doing, Don. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. Yeah, uh, just keep it, you know, the more the merrier. And it's uh, nice to hear there's other people having these same conversations as well. And 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 let's keep growing it. Let's keep doing yeah. it. So, so Fran, I know you said you had no complaints to lead off. But in I, the last, how long have we gone? 20, 30 minutes? About 30 minutes, have yeah. You, have you built up a complaint no, in that time? No, no complaints. Okay. No complaints. But, saved another week. Yeah, but we do have a question this week. I want to ask you a bunch of questions. I want to have them answered immediately. It's a simple question. Um, no, I didn't hear you. What was your question? So we did get one question this week. It's a new caller. So it's the first time, long time. And even though it's to both of us, it's really geared more towards you. Okay. So I kind of kept it a surprise. Um, so here, here you go. Hello, Tom and Fran. My name is Dolores. You may know me from my role in the 1964 blockbuster film, Mary Poppins. I am indeed the bird woman. At first, I was hurt by Tom's expression of fear when it comes to me and my birds. Dear Thomas, please do not fear me. All I wish to do is support our avian friends. This brings me to my question and reason for calling. Winter is approaching, and I would like to know which plants would best support my local birds during these cold, cold months. Since filming, I have moved to central New Jersey. Isn't that where you're from? Oh, Tom, perhaps we could have a cup of tea together sometime, if you're not too frightened. You can come too, Fran. Toodaloo. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I oh, think I know where she, yeah. she moved to in New Jersey, and that's underneath my bed. That's uh, where I've been frightened that she's lived for all these years. Well, she's been keeping tabs on you after all this time. <laughs> but, it's nothing uh, creepy about I'm, that. I'm going to have to decline the invitation for tea. I'm not a, I'm not a hot uh, beverage drinker. No. no coffee, no tea. I don't even like soup that much. Mm -hmm. Although I was just at a, a, a dinner banquet like a, a couple of days ago, and they had a, a soup that really piqued my interest. It was Wisconsin cheese soup, which Ooh. I didn't know was a thing, but it makes me want to visit Wisconsin. Ooh, That's a, I didn't know that was a thing either, but that sounds really, <laughs> really appetizing to me. Yeah. So <laughs> this was a great call. It, it was. A <laughs> it really was very formal. Yeah. And yes. They had, it well, seems like they had some formal training in the English language. It appears as though Dolores has cleaned herself up since her appearance. I always assumed that's. 
that wasn't really a character. That was just really her appearance that they just found someone that fit that role. It could very well could be. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. She sounded very, very regal. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, but she, she, she asked a, a really great, great question, especially at this time of the year. Um, just what, what native plants mm -hmm. uh, can be used to help feed birds over the winter. So, you know, to me, I really feel, uh, it, and I know there's a lot of um, different uh, thoughts about this, but mm -hmm. like instead of a bird feeder in the winter, if you had enough of this food, you wouldn't need, the birds wouldn't yeah. be so dependent on bird feed. And with the bird feeders, you're not always attracting the kind of birds, the native birds that you're mm -hmm. trying to get. It's a lot of starlings and things like that. So uh, we kind of put together a, 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 just a short list of things that are native, especially if you're in central New Jersey that are native to the area that uh, would be helpful. So we broke it down into two categories. One was berry and one was seed. Mm -hmm. um, so berry, I'll throw a couple out if you want to throw a couple yeah, out. Uh, yeah. You know, the first two things I thought of off the top of my head were winterberry and chokeberry. Uh, winterberry, of course, uh, red berries that mm -hmm. uh, you'll see now. Chokeberry, there's a black and a red. One likes it a little more wet than the other, but they hold on. They're not the bird's favorites, so they're a little more persistent, and they're there later in the winter when food starts running short. That's that's their go-to at that point. Yeah, I'm a Fran. I've I've lost track of where you were on this list. I know you said the first either <laughs> first one, two. two or three. I I, I, I said the first two. <laughs> So, you want me to uh, do the next one too? No, so the, okay. the next ones was uh, possum hall viburnum, which mm -hmm. you just brought up as your your plant of the week yeah. for that's hot. Yeah. And um and then arrowwood viburnum is another one that's um that's uh, really nice as well. Yeah, um sumac, which we've talked about and, and Tom has talked about using it as a spice and mm -hmm. and uh, someone in our I Facebook tried it yet. But. Someone in our Facebook said that's where pink lemonade orin originated. You know, I that's every year I forget about doing this and i think about it when i see this uh the sumax really starting to light up with this red color now i'm like oh yeah i meant to try and make lemonade with that yeah. which it's not really lemonade but you can take that um that stand of berries yeah and uh and put it in just water and then leave it out in the sun and it'll more make like a pinkish lemonade tasting drink yeah and, and uh, i've heard it's really good i've never tried it i've heard it was good too so it has multi-purposes plus it's uh it's it's great for the birds mm -hmm. a lot of berries and the other one is bayberry something we don't think about too often because it's not something we see naturally where we're at it's mm -hmm. more at the, the 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 beaches and the sandy yeah. sandy yep. conditions but bayberry is very important for them and that uh is a, it's a big staple for them. then the last two as far as berries go are beauty berry and then virginia creeper which beauty berry is a, a really awesome looking plant um it's native range and or ends a little bit south of here yeah. for the northern reaches of it but um and then Virginia creeper is a really cool plant that I don't think a lot of people, uh, a lot of people think it's poison ivy. When yeah, I see it. They do. Uh, but so it has five leaves. It has five leaves. Three. But the new leaves will sometimes only have three. The new yeah. shoots yeah. will only have three. So that's where I think a lot of people get confused. But it's also like a, a creeping vine. Um, can really, when you get in some sunlight, can really go nuts. Yeah. But it has a, a berry on it that's different than the poison ivy berries that they that poison ivy will get. And um, and birds lose those as well. Awesome. So, and then we wanted to, you know, a lot of the times for the, the items that we're listing is seed, uh, they can be spent by the time winter comes around. Mm -hmm. It's really dependent, but uh, the, the first two I had were, were coneflower, which we know finches love uh, coneflower. The stalks are, are pretty stiff and uh, birds are able to land on them and eat the seeds. The other one is penstemon, which uh, Greg Tepper did say on the last episode with uh, West Laurel Hill Nature Sanctuary that should be deer resistant it's in the um the mint family very cool so um the other one we have on here is liatris the liatris species will sometimes hold that seed a little bit longer and birds will really enjoy eating that yeah there was one other i threw on the list and i forgot you didn't have it but i was i was taking a walk around the pond and i saw hibiscus um which which is important for ducks um ducks like the seed so the those seed pods are kind of more yeah. upright and eventually they'll fall as the the winter goes on so yeah yeah i didn't even think about some of the things that ducks would Ducks kind of just sometimes you forget that they're birds. Yeah, but they are birds. Yeah, I guess it's maybe for most people remember they are birds, <laughs> but sometimes I consider them a different thing. <laughs> <laughs> now having the conversation with with the bird lady is it less intimidating? No, it's no. even more intimidating. I'm I'm <laughs> as scared as ever. It's kind of something I've pushed down inside me for so long that I kind of forgot about. Yeah. Um, until people remind me of it, and <laughs> this was a, a good. I, to be honest i'm when did that movie come out 
1964. Dolores was already looking aged at that yeah. point. So, little known fact, she was actually only 23 when she moved in. Was is that true? <laughs> no, is that no, true? no, no, not true at all. I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> all right so we should we have a lot of stuff we should probably yes. move on um so i know our next segment is grow read a book where mm -hmm. you you've really taken the lead on this and this is where you it, it's it's kind of like a short form book report yeah uh, oh yeah but uh, i did get some help i mentioned earlier from the lewis family and i have an opening jingle for you oh for awesome. grow, we have awesome. intro music for grow Reader i was Books. gonna say this i was gonna introduce this as the jingleist segment it is no longer jingleist you ready yep grow read a book i like books <laughs> that was better think? than anything i've ever come up with yeah. <laughs> how do you like that yeah how many members are there of the lewis family it i, like I there think there were children. there's three children and and they had a lot of fun doing this they provided at least you know, that's like a five second jingle. They they provide at least three to five minutes worth of content. Yeah. And it, <laughs> all which was hysterical. Some of it sounded like they were starting to chant and rebel. Like, <laughs> go read a book, go read a book. <laughs> like it was starting to like. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. I was thinking Lord of the Flies at, at some point, like with the chanting, it was, it was. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you guys so much for that. That was great. <laughs> no but, problem. So the, I promised a plant centric book Yes. I didn't say it was going to be native plants, but it's more plant centric. Okay. And that was a, a book I just listened to called uh, The Botany of Desire, A Plant's Eyed View of the World uh, by Michael Pollan. And now this book is is uh, 20 years old. So it came out in 2001. But it was really interesting listening to uh, all the topics that that were talked about. It really focused on four plant species. Okay, um, Those were apples, tulips, cannabis, and potatoes. and uh, you probably could have done this with infinite amount of plant species, but one of the things that we like to think about is we're kind of as humans, we're conquering nature. Uh, we're going through, we're the ones in control here and picking out what's going to live and what's going to die. And then but think about plants relationships with, well, I was going to say bees, but think about plants relationship with flies, like Fran mentioned yeah. earlier, how they're kind of adjusting themselves through selection. And it's more of a, uh, cohabitation type thing in a way um that's not the proper term but basically the flies are attracted to certain color flowers and then those flowers are gonna well they're the ones that are gonna reproduce yeah. and there's gonna be more of that that color and it's not necessarily the fly that's picking it's almost the flower saying i'm gonna attract more flies by be by being this shade of pink i'm gonna attract more bees i'm gonna attract more flies or because i have certain qualities i'm gonna attract more animals or people so it's not as much of a a one-way road that people are control here as as you might think in the author's view and uh really think about apples he starts out talking about johnny appleseed johnny appleseed if you didn't know was a real person named john chapman um that was lived in the early or late 1700s early 1800s and uh and one of some of the things i didn't know about johnny appleseed was that he was pretty smart in that he would look to where uh, new development was going to happen. Now, this is the beginning of the, the uh, well, after colonization, but beginning of or the, the United States as a country. So all of the settlement primarily was on the eastern seaboard. But he would say, well, he was from Massachusetts, but he'd say, well, I think they're going to develop in, in western Pennsylvania. So he moved to Allegheny County in western Pennsylvania, and then he moved into Ohio and eventually into Indiana. And everywhere he went, he would bring apple seeds with him and start apple nurseries. And uh, not to sell the apples, but to sell the trees. Part of that was as these people, as people moved further west, a lot of that land was up free. They wanted people to settle there. But one of the, the contingencies of that is that you planted your own apple orchard of 50 apple trees. The idea being, well, now we aren't going to have, okay, this person isn't coming to, into this town in Ohio and claiming his 50 acres here, then claiming them in near Marietta, and then claiming them near Cleveland, and then claiming all these, just keep constantly moving around so he could accumulate land. If they got to plant apple trees, they have to wait for those apples to become mature so they're producing fruit. They're literally setting down roots yeah. was the idea behind it. Well, Johnny Appleseed would move to these places before the development would happen, start his apple nursery. 
now you have all the settlers coming and they need to buy apples. Well, he had the apple trees. Pretty smart at that yeah, at that time. Totally. And um, he lived very meagerly. And a lot of times he wanted to be somewhat nomadic. So he would move really. As soon as there got to be too many people, he'd move to the next place, put someone in charge of his nursery, and then just kind of collect on his estate at that point. Um, now, at that time, and today, apple trees are better grown as grass, not as yeah. as from seed. From seed, you don't know what you're going to get. From a graft, you can say, okay, I'm buying a, a tree that's going to be a Red Delicious or a Granny Smith or yeah, whatever you they, choose. They know which rootstock is the best you mm -hmm. can buy, and it's a lot of them are numbered, like rootstock X1342, you yeah. know, and, and that's what you're yep, getting because exactly. you know you can do good grafting with that. Now, that time, all these grafts were European varieties with some very, very new American varieties from the, the Eastern Seaboard again. Um so Johnny Appleseed, well, to carry a bunch of grafts was going to be really, we don't call him Johnny Apple Graft, it was Johnny Appleseed. He's carrying a bunch of grafts across, like, how are you, you going to carry all these grafts and keep them alive traveling across the country, um, or at least to the Midwest? So he did it from seed, which basically ended up being very unreliable in what the plants would be. But you could take a hell of a lot of seeds versus all these, these tree grafts that you had to keep alive. So um, now, but the thing is, when stuff was grown from seed, now people were picking out what they liked and what they didn't from the new varieties that were basically emerging. And they'd say, oh, this is really good. So I'm going to harvest cuttings of this and graft it on and create more of this tree because I really like that one. Um, so that was really interesting is that the apple itself was making itself attractive to the people. It wasn't so much the people saying, oh, I like this apple. It was the apple because eventually it, became attractive be to people. Because it produced such juicy and flavorful yeah. fruit people desired it mm -hmm. and very biblical in a, in a oh, sense yeah. if you think about yeah. it going back to like the original sin yep. but it's you know it, it ensured its existence and spread across the it country. was it would either have prolific fruit or it was tastier or it was now it's also important to remember that most apples weren't consumed at yeah. that time it was uh or consumed uh as being eaten they're consumed through drinking because apple cider uh, while mildly alcoholic, was safer to drink than water in a lot of these places. Um, and then it was actually the temperance movement where the that some fun little side note, the temperance movement is where the apple a day keeps the doctor away uh, phrase came from because you had all these people saying down with liquor and booze, get rid of alcohol. And these apple growers needed another outlet for all these apples that they'd grown for sometimes 50 decades mm -hmm. and a lot at that time. So um, they started to chant on the uh, health benefits of having having apples and that's why we eat apples today it's really not a a, a thing um that was practiced as much back then the other th and the other quote that this uh, author said that was really interesting about apples was apples are the apples we have today are as american as we are as as humans that came from europe um because they are wildly different than the original apple that's from kazakhstan and and asia and uh if you brought an apple like a, a red delicious apple like we talked about you brought that back to asia it looked nothing like the fruit that that tree came from you know it's funny i i just had a, a very similar conversation with agatha because she was saying you know the the apples and the apple trees we had on our farm in poland i haven't come across an apple like that here mm -hmm. in the states and she was yeah. trying to explain it to me like what she remembered yeah. an apple yeah. being you know and now you can you can find the plants but you can't like we're able to mm -hmm. find what kind they were, but you can't find them for sale. Yeah, and that was one of the other things he went to. Uh, there's a place in Geneva, New York, that has a lot of the American apples and some of the, the the Asian apples as well, and then European apple varieties. I think it was like 14 or something, some yeah. apple varieties, something crazy. But he, the, one of the folks that he wrote about, went to Kazakhstan and tried some of these original apples, and some of them tasted like bananas. Some of them were really tiny. Some of them were huge. It was like nothing resembled like what we eat here. Wow. And that's and one of the things he actually criticized about the apple industry now is we're kind of boiling it down to five to ten different varieties where we have hundreds of different varieties of um, uniquely American apples. And um, like the Arkansas black is uh, an apple one of our friends who's a grower grows. You're not going to find that in a grocery store. You're going to find Granny Smith's, Red Delicious, Golden Delicious, yeah. Fuji's. Uh, Fuji and Gala. Yeah, you know, maybe a, a handful it. more. And um we're losing so much of our history and stuff that's going to the Arkansas black is an apple that grew really well in Arkansas and it might not grow well in Illinois. It might not grow well in, on the West coast. 
but it grew well in Arkansas, and that was its kind of claim to fame. And, um, yeah, so that was a really unique part. He talked about the same thing with tulips, how tulips kind of would adjust their color, and then all of a sudden you'd have a run on tulips, and everyone was searching for a black tulip, and then you finally had something that was black, and all of a sudden that tulip kind of took over. You had a certain color that was caused by a virus, and all of a sudden that took over because uh, all these the tulips were – attractive to people and that's why they spread it wasn't so much that the people said oh that's attractive and it yeah. was it was a co thing it wasn't a, a single one-way street because it's it's not being spread because of its its value to i guess yeah. apples possibly it was a value to humans to mm -hmm. to have the cider or, yeah, or yeah. the food source but like tulips the, the value was just it was purely aesthetic yeah, aesthetic yeah but that tulip succeeded in getting itself to replicate and and have a lot more of its offspring out there yeah. um because it was attractive to people so it wasn't so much that the people said oh i'm gonna do this it, ma it made itself attractive to people um the next one was with uh potatoes i'm gonna skip over the actual third section and go to the fourth section okay because um potatoes you have the irish potato famine potatoes are grown in ireland primarily i've learned this through the book too to get the, the English had taken all the valuable agricultural land, and this is something you could grow in really poor soil and uh, and get a crop out of that you could eat. Um, think of where they grow potatoes now. One of the major potato producing areas is Maine yeah. and um, does not have great soil up in Maine, but they produce a heck of a lot of potatoes. And, uh, and that's one of the crops that thrives up there versus corn or soybeans mm -hmm. or something like that. Um, well, then the potato blight came in, and that's kind of said we need to have some of these things potatoes that are resistant and you get into GMOs and, and what happened there. And they created a thing called the new leaf potato. Uh, Monsanto did. Now remember this is back in the late nineties, early two thousands. And, um, and it was okay. So you got away from spraying a lot of insecticides and herbicides because you had a potato that had the insecticide injected into its DNA in a sense, or I shouldn't say injected, but worked into its DNA. It had that BT that was, it was an organic uh, uh, insecticide, but it now had the BT inside of it versus sprayed on top. Well, the questions then were, and this was, again, 20 years ago, well, how safe is the potato to eat if it's something that's going to kill all these insects yeah. when you eat it? Yeah. And um, he talks about some of the organic growers that were in the area, and they didn't really use as much. They still use some of the, the insecticides, but the ones that were really successful found the potatoes that worked really well for their area. They didn't just grow Yukon golds and russets and the things that the consumer wanted. They grew the thing that worked well in their area and then told the value to the consumer. Um, so that was interesting. Now how it ties to Halloween. I said a lot of this is yes. Halloween focus yeah. was the last or the third planning focus on was cannabis. Okay. And talk about how throughout like human history, people were just so like, incredibly drawn to getting high in some way whether it's through liquor or or pot or all kinds of stuff well here's here's the thing that gets me with with cannabis mm -hmm. someone had to figure out to smoke it yeah so how many things did people try smoking i think they were smoking a lot of stuff yeah i think they were smoking a lot of i think things it was too. like hey we're gonna mix this stuff together and see what happens because the same thing with tobacco yeah. tobacco became wildly popular yeah. because it was smokable yeah and um yeah, people just they knew they could smoke certain things or they probably started out they you put it in the fire and said oh i get, like the feeling i got when i put it in the fire so let's try and do it this yeah. other way um but uh and a lot of the reason he goes into some of the politics about cannabis and how it's rejected by church and state because it sparked creativity and objecting to the norm and those kind of things but one of the things that was really interesting about this section is he starts talking about witches and sorcerers okay and I, this was another thing I was mowing my lawn and I had to get off the lawnmower and go and tell my wife what I just heard because <laughs> it was just like it was so wildly strange and fascinating at the same time. But um, so witches conventionally are known, oh, you, they can fly on broomsticks. And um, and that's kind of become the mythology of it. But I guess there were like people who considered themselves witches and they had an actual flying potion. And when they took this potion, it was usually used as like a bomb or yeah. or, or in, in it wasn't necessarily ingested. It was used in other ways. Um, but they had a flying potion that they would make them fly. They felt like they were teleported to these other areas and actually flying through space. Someone actually observed them when they used this potion and said, you were just kind of writhing around on the floor for a couple <laughs> hours. And I wasn't sure if I needed to call a doctor. But um, 
but they felt like they were flying because they were just going through like a, a trip. Yeah. And um, it was a, a combination of deadly nightshade, which okay. has hallucinogenics yeah. in it. Um, toad skin, which contains a, a compound similar to DMT, which yeah. is another hallucinogenic drug. Um, things like that, bat's blood. That, that, that made me think of Beavis yeah. and Butthead licking looking oh those. yeah yeah but bats blood really. bats blood um sweet flag a native plant there yeah uh it would be used and there's other plants that would be used another thing that i just found when i was looking up a recipe for this was uh infant fat and <laughs> <laughs> at least what they wrote was when you, if you got the infant before it was baptized it wasn't gonna go to god or something like that yeah. so if you got it after then you had had blood on your troubles hands. to yeah. worry about but um so with the the fat, which I'm sure wasn't yeah. always from a child, yeah. Um, but the fat would actually make it more like a bomb or a cream okay. instead of yeah. a, um, a liquid. Like, okay. So like that was one of the reasons yeah. they'd use something like that. Yeah. And uh, what they would then do at that point, and this is where I was just like, this is just wild, was uh, you'd apply it to uh, pulse points okay. typically, um, but some witches would apply it vaginally using right. a special wooden stick, and it would cause them to hallucinate and feel like they were flying. And that is where the witch's broom, you're riding the witch's broom came from, was this using this flying potion, using a, a broomstick in a way. Um, and <laughs> and, and I, I heard that and I was like, that is just so, this sort of wild fact from history. That I needed to go and share it with my wife immediately. <laughs> well, now <laughs> I, I understand it. why they it's... wanted to burn witches and why they thought yeah, they were yeah. so. They were just uh, like yeah. modern or Renaissance drug druggies. Yeah, basically. I mean, this is like a whole like this is a whole process like infant fat and yeah, yeah, and, and it was uh, yeah they basically made and they I'm sure they made other things too, but that was it was just their drive to get high was what uh wow and using some native plants, which is uh, nice to see that. As long as you're planting See, native creative plants, uses. <laughs> I don't have any comment. <laughs> Actually, I have a million comments, and I'm just. I'm, I'm I tried to keep that up. as clean as possible for our our listener. Yeah. Uh, I didn't want to go into the same Listen. amount of depth as the whole did. I, I had a whole rolodex of responses, and I'm flicking through. Got nope, 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 <laughs> nope, 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 nope. Just gonna toss it, and just. But that works really well into our, our topic, also brought to us by Alyssa Lewis. Yeah. Because she suggested we talk about uh, plants that have something to do with Halloween Maybe. in some way. And I'll play our scary music. Oh. Yeah. And uh, the easiest way to do that is through the names of the plants. Yes. Because some of them, we talked about before, some of these plants have just crazy um common names and we don't know where they came from <laughs> and we're not going to go through all the botanicals because no, it's, no. it's it's a pretty extensive list and with the common names if if you want to make a halloween themed garden a lot mm -hmm. of these you should be able to find they're they're pretty common yeah yeah so i broke it up into four sections here and um and kind of uh they're all somewhat halloween themed first was the candy section which had things that Halloween's known now for for giving out candy, so I yeah. used things that sounded similar to candy. This is really good. You want to take turns doing a section? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You could. We'll do you, two. You do two, then I'll do two. Okay. All right. So, um, sugar maple, which mm -hmm. is very sugary if you think about it, and it's it's funny because it made me think immediately of the uh, chapter of breeding sweet grass with with the collecting mm -hmm. of the the uh, sugar maple syrup and sweet flag, which. Not only is it candy, it's, it can help you uh, yeah. with a witch's potion. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, dual purpose. You have sweet pepper bush, which that would be like a really cool sounding candy. Yeah. I'm thinking of something almost like um, what are those, the hot tamales, like oh, yeah. the sweet pepper yeah. bush. And uh, sweet birch. And then you have sweet burn, which is all. You know, I have to throw one in that's actually real, but tea berry gum. Yeah. Which is oh, yeah. Galtheri procumbens, which is wintergreen. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, that's actually something that was really used for for mm -hmm. sweet. But and those... a, honestly, a lot of these, some of these at least, are used to make some sort of candies. I'm thinking yeah. sugar maple, and then you make maple candies out. Yeah, of it, so. yeah, totally. So I'm not gonna find them a lot on on your Halloween <laughs> trick or treating <laughs> list. But so I'm handing out sugar maple this year. For... <laughs> my my next section was uh, was ingredients you'd find between the eye of newt and the blind worm sting. And um, those were some things that just kind of had like that that 
you'd sight see it in that witch's potion and yeah. you wouldn't blink an eye at it. Yeah. So for that, I had a Fox Love Beard Tongue, which, which is, is one I always, whenever I see that name, I'm like, who the heck came up with that? Yeah. So, and uh, then uh, then Black Chokeberry is another, another yeah, good name for that. That is a great, that is a great name. Black Elderberry is mm-hmm. another one that just kind of has that, that feel to yeah. it. Oh, yeah. Spotted Horse Mint. That sounds like a potion, uh, potion ingredient right there. Yeah, and then uh, another thing going into the big cauldron is spatter dock. Yes, and pig nut. Pig nut. And then, of course, you had to add lizard's tail yeah. to that one as well. <laughs> <laughs> one lizard's tail. <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking of the witches from Macbeth yeah. right now. Do it like saying spotted horseman, <laughs> tail of lizard. So uh, the next category that you had down, and, and I give Tom all the credit for this. Tom assembled this list. Uh, he did a fantastic job. Um, gory, which is not my forte. I don't know why the horror and gore came to Halloween because it wasn't historically there. If you've listened to us long enough, you know I'm a big fan of history. I guess it wasn't historically there, but that's kind of been what Halloween's kind of become. Yeah. And, um, yeah, there's a one. I don't know if this person listens. It's one of my – somewhat neighbors that live down the street and they have like this whole like zombie corpse skeleton display they put up every year and they have like a, a horse trailer and they have like a skeleton like on its knees pleading for its life with a, a thing there with like a giant hatchet that cut off its head and then you have like this bloody bag with like a corpse in it <laughs> inside the tra- I'm like who took the time to do all this this <laughs> isn't how halloween's about walking around and pretending you're a ghost <laughs> like, <laughs> Put a sheet over your head and, and, and oh. put some holes in it and, and say boo. Like that's oh. it's not I don't know how the gore got brought to Halloween. And I'm sorry if I'm insulting some of the gore Halloween fans, but you should know my stance on Halloween is very close to my stance on Mary Poppins. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not, not a fan of the scary I'm, I'm not a fan scary of scary movies, movies or yeah. gory movies. I'm not I'm not gonna watch them, but uh a, a couple uh which which sound very, very scary, rice cut grass, mm-hmm. which really does you rub your hand against it. You're you're cutting oh, yeah. your hand. You're yep. cutting your hand up, and hackberry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then uh, blunt blunt spike rush, which is Ooh. kind of an oxymoron. When yeah. You think yeah. About it. Pretty much. And then poison ivy because you can get poison. I guess that's yeah. not so gory, but uh, no, it's but also it's a, poison. Yeah. So uh, next category, spooky. Yeah. And actually, that's this is actually like a pretty pretty more extensive list because it's. A lot, you know, here's what's funny. A lot of these you'll recognize from even like movies like Harry Potter mm-hmm. or books like Harry yeah. Potter where they're they're doing potions. So a lot of them will give you that. And I guess you got the- Yeah, they're the, potion-y. They're just all around kind of spooky. And the yeah. first part of the list is from Illinois Cooperative Expense Extension. Because I just was Googling, I was trying to look for an article. I'm like, oh, yeah. I wonder if there's like a scary Halloween plant thing. But Illinois Cooperative Extension kind of did like an abridged version of this with some plants we didn't yeah. include. Um, those being Devil's Claw, uh, Doll's Eyes, which I, is a plant I've heard of. Yes. Um, ghost pipe, nice. which is another, it has another common name I'm blanking on right now. But that's kind of, it just is a, um, I've been seeing a lot of, a little bit from the ground and is like, a like a white, white. Yeah. Kind of. I've been seeing a lot of pictures of that actually yeah, online yeah. right now. I guess and this then, is uh, the season for it. And Bloodroot is a, another oh, one that, very nice. That, very so nice. yeah. So they put together their own list. So I want to give them credit. I didn't want to make sure, or, or I want to make sure I didn't, steal anything from anybody but but then you came up with a pretty extensive oh, list yeah. of your own so a couple of them uh spider wart ohio mm-hmm. spider wart or or just any spider wart hairy beard tongue which is a yeah, that's a great... something like a hex that would be cast on yeah. <laughs> pussy willow pussy willow because or of the cats cat, yeah. cats are a halloween thing yes and uh broom sedge yeah. so there you go like that could be either Indra pogon or carrix yeah they're both yep. broom sedge so uh dog bane probably that might have should have been in the, the ingredients list but, uh that's true um swamp milkweeds swamps are, are pretty yeah. scary evening primrose that's another uh, that's one that just kind of totally. like that you sounds like it's from about it. nightmare before christmas yeah it doesn't seem like it would be a bright yellow flower it seems like really yeah. like dark yeah, and deadly and, primrose yeah. um bitter panic grass yeah i like that that's a good one so uh deer tongue mm-hmm. so that's that's spooky yeah. if you think about yeah. it uh, Virginia creeper, and that does creep, and it is it can get can yeah. can get aggressive, so that's perfect. And uh, rattlesnake grass. Yeah. So uh, yeah, snakes scary, kind of spooky. fit into the, the totally. spooky, scary thing. That's why we included rattlesnake master as well. Um, 
and then the the two just home runs that have something Halloweeny in the name, Bone Set, Ooh. and Witch Hazel. Nice. Uh, Got to include them on your your Halloween plant list. So if you're doing a Halloween garden, it may not be spooky looking. I guess we could have done things that, that were yellows or orange and blacks, yeah. but you know you can do that as well. But add a lot of these in. It's it's a lot of fun talking about. Oh yeah, a things lot of these interesting names. Yeah, it's, you it's, could have a garden of some of these things saying, this is my potion garden. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, that's great. You know, and that was a great book, too. Um, I wonder if our, our listeners have any suggestions for books they yeah. would want to hear you talk yeah. about, too. I've actually I, – I started listening to an audio book, and I realized – I'm just going to throw this out there. I know a lot of our listeners are authors. If you want me to, to uh, narrate your audio book, the person that's doing the one, obviously they're a voice actor and they're very good, but it's such a soothing voice. I'm listening to it while I'm going to drive. I'm afraid I'm going to crash. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Need something a little more abrasive, but it's the topic. It's it's very fitting. Mm -hmm. Like I'm, it's not a knock on that. Just saying, I'll offer my services if anyone wants that. Want to do a, want to do a pod? Deck? Yeah, let's do a quick pod deck and uh -huh. then. Um... Then we got a couple little housekeeping things. And we we're, do. We're actually doing pretty good. We're about an hour and five minutes. Perfect. We're not. Yeah. I thought this one was going to go way too long. Uh, yeah. But I guess we should ask if you have Halloween plants that you you want to include on our list, send them to us. Yeah. Join the group. Email us or leave, leave a, a, a comment on the question and comment line. Brand's going to give you the number at the end of the episode. Um let us know what plants you think should be included on our Halloween list because it was a lot of fun putting that together because you start looking at the plant list and you're like, oh, yeah, some of these are – did a witch name this? Because <laughs> it's pretty interesting. <laughs> you know, here's one. If you can't really do it, but I'm looking through, and some of these ones are just, like I said, things that you can't, you can't really do. Um, and some of these you've done, like my latest read. Like yeah, I should yeah, probably yeah. just put that in the done pile. but. Um, this one is replay your most downloaded episode. Now we don't have to replay it, but we could talk about what our mm. most downloaded episode is. And you know, the funny thing is when we did our top 10 at the end of the year last year, you know, we had been doing it for almost like a year. Ten, 10 and a half months. Yeah. yeah. So there's nothing on the top 10 from December of last year. That's still on the top 10. And actually the one that's number one on our list is three times as listened to as what was number one last yeah. year. So, um, and it's kind of surprising to me. I, it is and it isn't. It's not the episode that I thought would be. And it's still it's number one by a by few a by yeah. a, by like four hundred listens. That the next one is, and that's uh, uh, a rooted discussion. Um, and it's native plant gardening. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was um, John McGee. Uh, from the Native Plant Podcast. And McGee Design. Yeah, uh, Becky LeBoy from Ocean County Soil mm -hmm. and Conservation District. And it was, I'm trying to remember the other guest. It was uh, Rick McCoy, R oh, one of right. our number one listeners. Number, and Fran forgot one. his name. That's <laughs> <laughs> but it, that's that's by far, and I think I think people just appreciate, that's, that's something that mm -hmm. we find our listeners want to know more about. Yeah. Um, and apparently they, they really did because that, but that, and it wasn't, it's not like it shot up to the number one spot immediately. It just kind of gained steam over time and it just keeps getting listened to the same amount consistently, like where other episodes kind of have their peak and die off. This one's just not dying and mm -hmm. it just keeps, you have to scroll pretty far back in the episodes to, to find it at this yeah. point. That one was in January or February of this year. That long ago? Yeah. Wow. The first one was in January. I think this was our second one, maybe. Okay. Yeah. 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 So maybe February or March. Mm -hmm. It was. It was. It was a while ago. So it just keeps gaining steam, and that's, you know, I, I guess if we're going to learn anything from that, it's that that's that's the type of thing our listeners mm -hmm. want to hear. Yeah. Like that's mm -hmm. so. Um, and I'm sure we're going to do a top ten. Yes. This year. Oh yeah. We're going to do our our top ten, and I don't think anything's overtaking that. So we just kind of spoiled the. Yeah. yeah and i don't see unless you like this episode enough then, is, then maybe it will although i will say there's one or two episodes that are more recent that are in the top five already mm -hmm. so yeah. um you know and that just it says about how our listenership has grown too yeah you know but going to that episode it was a really really educational episode um, I, I learned a lot from that one of the things 
that uh that I always think about our podcast, how it's Native Plants Healthy Planet. We don't talk about plants enough, but that was when we talked a little about plants, but I was surprised how much we talked about the philosophy of gardening with native plants and how to get people involved on board, like, yeah. on board with, as from a, a landscaper's point of view, some of the techniques they, they use to get people on board with native plants. How much we talk about soil in that episode? Oh, a, um, a ton. Yeah. Yeah. So it was, it was about gardening, but I think it's, it's really tough from a, a podcasting ep- or standpoint to give you a play-by-play on this is if you want to plant a native plant garden, this is what you need to do because everyone's yard's different. Yeah. And uh, so I think they did our panel did a fantastic job of displaying that, that you need to look at what, what's your soil, what's your, your moisture condition, what's your sunlight condition. And now, okay, now you can start to develop a plant list, but it's going to be unique to where you are yeah. and all those, what your soil is, what your sunlight is, how much water do you get? If you, if you want to supplementally water, it's, and then you can finally start to dig in and find the, the 200 plants that are going to work for you then. And, and it, it really was more of, of learning how to celebrate what your area is. Mm-hmm. Like if, if you're in a coastal plain or, or Piedmont or Appalachia or whatever that zone is, appreciate that. Don't try to amend it or make it what it's not. Try to, to work towards its strong points and, and really celebrate what it is. Like if you're where we're at, it's not going to be a whole lot of evergreens. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it's going to be more deciduous, but now's the time of the year that that is really wonderful. You know, it's it's paying dividends right now. Yeah. So it's it's celebrate that. And it, and it was a lot of different philosophies, a lot of which that I hadn't considered. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I took something away from each guest on that one. And and it was a great, great episode, a lot of different perspectives. And, and possibly we should have a follow up on yeah. that one. Maybe we should do. I bet you. Claudia West would be a fantastic person mm-hmm. to have on oh, yeah. on that one. So maybe we can get that one going. So you want to do a little little uh, house housekeeping? Yeah. So we mentioned the Saul contest. Um, we haven't heard from Saul. I think he's a little disappointed. We haven't gotten more I, entries. I think so. But we did actually get a decent have, amount of of entries. We have five entries um, of all different, um, uh, you know, a, a lot of different styles. And uh, ability levels, mm-hmm. which is fantastic. Actually, we have six. six. Yeah, I th- yeah, we got yeah, our six we, not we too six. long ago. So I think we were actually supposed to do this last buzz episode and we forgot. We're going to give you till the next buzz episode. No, what, what's yeah. our time frame? So like the next buzz episode, I think, which is episode 79, you and I should pick. That, yeah, that's when two. we're going to pick the two. Although should you and I pick one and let the listeners pick one? Yes. So yeah. what we'll do is you and I will go through, we'll pick our favorite, mm-hmm. and then we'll throw the rest up on the Facebook page mm-hmm. and let the listeners yeah. vote on which one they like the best. And we'll 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 figure those two out. So we'll give hmm. we're giving we probably every, should have talked about this before. Yeah. <laughs> before so let's give everyone two weeks to get the rest of their entries in. Yep. So yep. episode 79, we're gonna say we're done receiving entries and tom and i are going to pick our favorite mm-hmm. and then after that we're going to put up the remaining ones for everyone to yeah vote on. so that would be episode 79 is going to be <clears> on <throat> uh, not november 3rd it'll be the oh excuse me yeah we, we'll probably record it on november 10th yeah so yeah. get it in but if you definitely want us to to count it Get, get it in by get, November. Get 10th. your entries in. We're gonna put a, a note in the Facebook group reminding everyone that you have to get your entries in. So yep. you have two weeks from listening to this to get your entry yeah. in if you want to be a part of it. Um two and, weeks from from probably a week and a I, half from when you listen to it. Yeah. If you really wanted to count, get it in by the ninth because we might record on the morning of the tenth. Yes. It could I, be the afternoon. Exactly. Of the 10th. So get yours in. Tom and I are gonna announce who's who our favorite is, and then we're gonna put the rest up for a vote. We'll do that for two weeks. Yeah, until the next buzz. So the next yeah. buzz, and then we'll get those two entries to Saul, and Saul will pick a, a winner. Yep. So, um, boy, that's really complicated. Yes. <laughs> and then the, the, those metrics. But we've might been change. letting it go. We've been letting we've it, let go. it go. We kind of have time. to draw. We, so this is your last call. Yes. If you want to enter, enter by by uh, end of we'll say end of next week. Yes. And then you'll definitely be in, and um, and then we're gonna go from there. So the the last uh, piece of housekeeping for us is just. We want to remind everyone, Tom and I have been doing a lot of talks recently. We, we feel very humbled and honored to be invited to, to speak to everyone. 
and we've loved seeing a lot of our listeners in these talks. And uh, our next talk is we have one more left scheduled and everyone has the opportunity if they wanted to be a part of it and, and hear this talk about growing the circle. Um, it is part of the Bowman's Hill Wildflower Pre Preserve Thursday Night Nature Talks. Um, we're going to conclude the series. We're the, uh, the, the tail end of the series and that's on Thursday, November 11th. Uh, we're the final speakers. It's available through Zoom, so you don't have to, to even leave the comfort of your house. You can wear your pajamas. And uh, if you want to see or expand on this, head over to bhwp.org and register. It's a uh, $15 registration. The program has a 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time start time. Uh, it's supposed to run an hour. We know we're not going to talk for just an hour. We're, we're averaging 75 minutes and then probably uh, 10 to 15 minutes question and answer. So. Uh, if, if you've heard us talk, you know we're not going to keep it to an hour. So if you want to be a part of that, head on over there and and uh, buy a ticket. It it supports a great organization with Bowman's Hill Wildflower Preserve, who has been a guest of ours. Um, and and you get to hear us talk and joke around and not be be serious yeah. and not be serious. Yeah, exactly. It's a and all the Bowman's Hill programs have been really They've been really wonderful. Good. So I'm excited for ours. We got a a, a tough list of speakers to follow so. yeah I, i'm actually a little intimidated being the finale just knowing everyone else that's that's oh yeah been speaking i'm like oh we got some some big shoes to fill so rain you got anything else for us no i think that's wow we not only did we cover a lot of ground today we did it efficiently that's not always the case with us. yeah no we we did our our that's hot or, or that's hot plants yeah we had two great plants in liquid ambar and by burn Styrasiflua, Styrasiflua and Viburnum nudum. Um, we had uh, two great articles mm -hmm. uh, in reference to uh, bumblebees, um, rare bumblebees and, and remnant prairies in Illinois. And also uh, my article about um, flies as pollinators. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we had the, a really good list of, of Halloween centric plants. Well, and I, I should ask, if you were gonna plant an actual ha Halloween garden, what would you plant? You know, I, 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 I was thinking New England aster. I'd have orange coneflower. Orange coneflower would be a good one. Yeah. Orange That's still starting to bloom. Helianthus angustifolius, which is my would be a great one. That's still blooming almost into now. It's kind of done. Now. I'd have cattails. Yeah. How did we forget Why, that? How plant? did we yeah. not put cattails yeah. oh. on, on the. <laughs> I, can't, I can't say I'm perfect. I only thought of 40 plants. So just, <laughs> but cattails would be perfect. Yeah. You know, and they they're showing interest right now. Mm -hmm. So yeah, but yeah, I think you you get some of those like deep dark purples. You'd probably yeah. have to get a, a liquid ambar in there somehow. Uh, yeah, totally, totally. Well, no, no, and witch some... hazel. I put yeah, a witch and hazel. hazel's blooming right now. But, yeah. That's a good one too. Witch hazel would be a great choice. So, that would be so. We we gave you great suggestions for yeah. for a Halloween garden. We had a great call, great new caller. Great the, caller. Hope she calls um, back again. I hope she doesn't. <laughs> 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 I that was enough. Of enough scariness i had for today and, and a, ver a very informative grow read a book yeah with yeah, a new nice jingle. new recipe for everyone to take home <laughs> <laughs> i think that wraps it up yeah so that is it thank you for joining us today we hope you enjoyed listening to the buzz thank you everyone for listening to native plants healthy planet presented by pilot Air Show. uh i'm giving a big thank you to rj comer for our buzz theme music and i think tom and i decided we're keeping this theme music mm -hmm. so and it's nightly suicide very halloween themed for for buzz music as well uh make sure you stream or buy rj's music on itunes spotify or wherever you consume your music follow us on twitter at pineland nursery facebook at pinelands nursery nj instagram at pinelands nursery or native plants underscore healthy planet and youtube at pinelands nursery don't forget about the question and comment line call us at 215-346-6189 ask a question leave a comment uh, when we play your comment on a future episode of The Buzz, we'll answer it uh, to the best of our knowledge or we'll phone a friend. Uh, and let's not forget about the Facebook group. We're coming up, man, we, we're coming up on almost 800 members. And again, all great interaction and uh, great photos. Everyone's sharing a lot of uh, great stuff right now, and we really appreciate it. And uh, a lot of people being kind, which I can't say for all Facebook groups. Tom and I were just share, <laughs> just going back and forth on one post we saw the other day in another Facebook group, and it was 80% negative and 20% positive. And I'd say oh, we're we're batting a thousand on our group. So keep it keep it going that that oh, yeah. way on ours. Yeah, um, we've mentioned it a bunch of times. You can buy shirts, and now that we're getting close to the holiday season, 
I can't think of a much better gift than a, a Native Plants Healthy Planet t-shirt. What a fantastic present. And actually, we've gotten some requests to, to actually do that. Um, so if you want to find the t-shirts, uh, you're going to our website, www.nativeplantshealthyplanet.com. There's a banner at the top that says buy t-shirts here. Click on that. That'll take you to our T-string store. And then there's a whole bunch of designs up there. Um, I've said it a bunch of times. Hats are coming. Uh, I'm going to try and get that done soon so that we can have them up again for the holiday season. Um, I think things ship pretty quick. Yeah. It takes a lot. When we get the samples, it takes a long time for us They've to get They've been shipping. The last two things but, I bought uh, ship pretty quick. But if you yeah. actually order things, they come pretty quick. But all the new there, – there are so many designs to choose from, so many great messages you can spread. Don't forget, whoever wins the salt contest is going to get a long sleeve Keep It Native shirt. Um, but there, there's a lot of great, great designs yeah, on there. So Tommy did a wonderful job. If you're job thinking with that. of a holiday gift and you don't know what to get that person who has everything, I bet you they don't have a Native Plants Healthy Planet <laughs> T-shirt, and uh, so that's something you can get them, and they'll be overjoyed to receive it. So, um, and as always, we aren't making any money off of this. All the money that is generated through these T-shirt sales and eventually hat sales is going to folks that we believe are doing the the right work that we've fe- featured on the podcast. Um, and once we get up to that critical mass again, we're going to give out another round of donation. Totally. Totally. So, we're looking forward to it. Um, as always, if you like what you're listening to, leave us a five-star review and hit subscribe. Uh, whether you're listening on Podbean, Spotify, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, really wherever you're consuming your podcast, you're able to do that. It goes a long way with us. If you write a, write a little blurb with that five-star review, I'll give you a personal shout out and a, a very kind compliment that I truly mean from the bottom of my heart um during our listener listener shout out section and uh and yeah yeah we get That's we it. need more five-star reviews we do. everyone w- we got a few but everyone was shy no one really left a comment so leave a comment and tom tom will say some really heartfelt nice kind yeah. now kind fran of. you're you're up for a secret this week but i don't when really we're, have a good secret you said you didn't have a good one and i was like Ooh, i have a really good halloween focused secret and yeah. uh and that's a little a uh, little delve into my uh, my criminal past <laughs> <laughs> i want to hear it because my secret was you know i was settling and what i have isn't really a great secret yeah. and it's not that big of a deal so i'm more interested in what you have yeah than, than uh it. back in in or, or i guess the end of 2010 um september i was found to be in violation of the the, the city of cobalt skills noise ordinance and i was sentenced Ooh. to do a bunch of community service um <laughs> it had typically been a fifty dollar fine, and then that year they changed it to fifty hours community service, which was very really steep. yeah. Wow. I had to do a bunch, and um, so I had to go to the the like Catholic charities okay. place, and then they told you where to go. And one of the things they had us doing was um was cleaning up old cemeteries, which was really with my interest in history was really cool. Yeah, I didn't want to give up a Saturday morning. Yeah, but um. But it was actually really cool because some of these, I, I, I don't find as much around where we are in New Jersey, but it seemed like upstate New York has a lot of these like really tiny old cemeteries just tucked away in the woods. And there'll be maybe like 20 to 100 people. Wow. And no one there is, that's buried there is, is newer than like 1900. It's really? like super, super old, just like. And is Old, anyone like, family maintaining plots. it? Like, is it being mowed? Well, like... I, I did. Oh, <laughs> that was, okay. That's what I was doing. <laughs> It was me and a, a couple other um, uh, cr- criminals, many of which had done things far worse than I did, and <laughs> had, many of which had much like leaner sentences than wow. I did too. Wow. They had to do like ten hours of community service for like breaking and entering. It was, it was nuts. <laughs> but um, anyway, I had to go to these these cemeteries, and they didn't even give you real weed whackers. They gave you the little things the, the, with the blade on the end, and you swung them back oh, and forth, like Caddyshack like the uh yeah. carl with the <laughs> yeah those the kind of things all right and i was in a I, it was halloween morning um and it was a saturday and i was in a like an old cemetery and the newest gravestone i could find was from 1879 wow so it was very very old this the headstones are actually falling over and you're swinging this thing around and you're trying to be respectful you don't want to hit a headstone but it was obvious that you were eventually going to whack a headstone yeah. and i remember i knocked a couple over and like you looked at these things wrong they were falling yeah. over yeah. it was like if you look at the dis- the Halloween displays and they have the headstones, yeah. that's what it looked like. The little yeah. rounded top ones that just said, and like, here lies so-and-so born or be this, be this. And that was it. And a lot, a lot, it was interesting to see how many people only lived like a very short time frame too. Um, but uh, yeah, that was, and then I went home and I'm like, man, if, if ghosts are real and like haunting is real tonight's the night. Cause I had to like knock a bunch of it's Halloween. 
and I just knocked like a bunch of these and chipped headstones and it was like I'm trying to be careful it was just yeah. really hard to and uh yeah but uh I'm I'm glad to say that I was not possessed in the, the <laughs> middle of that night um and then I, I made it out fine and that was yeah that's the extent of my criminal history too it wow was a, a couple of noise ordinance violations that's a <laughs> that great that's a great story yeah. that's a great story that just made me think of something that I don't know that I should share that's what's <laughs> hard with so many things I think about it makes me think we weren't you know I'm gonna share it because we we meant no I don't want to give anyone the idea that they should do this that's my concern because we weren't vandalizing anything or trying to cause anything. You're going to share it now? Or on yeah, I'll, I'll share okay. it. I'll share it now. So when I was younger, we had the idea that we wanted to try to, at night, touch Bowman Hills Tower. Mm -hmm. And it's a park, so it's closed at night. So we all, you know, no, we just wanted to go up and touch it mm -hmm. and co yeah. go back down. And we all dressed in black and we were recording it with like a cassette recorder, kind of like almost like ghost hunters yeah. you know yeah. like <laughs> yeah. it's in the middle of the night we're parked where our car wouldn't be seen and we're going through the woods blindly without flashlights because mm -hmm. we didn't want to get caught trying to make it up this hill just to put our hand on a tower and come away and of course as soon as we got to the top of the hill there were probably like six of us we realized that there were guards up there actually oh. <laughs> like protect so we never got to do it yeah, yeah. like we got kind of got up there and just went Oh well, and they probably knew you were there. They probably yeah. There were six of us going through the woods. <laughs> yeah, talking into a, a cassette tape. That's yeah. <laughs> you know, but we uh we we planned all this out to get to the top to go. Eh, well, we could see it, <laughs> yeah. and then we turned around and went back down, and that was the whole thing. Like we weren't being destructive or yeah. anything like that. I don't even think you could even get that close nowadays. Like the last time I went, I don't think oh, you're yeah, even yeah. getting away with that. You know, but. At least, at least I felt like it was somewhat innocent. We weren't yeah. looking to. Not like anything. me. I was. I was guilty <laughs> of violating. You were this. a miscreant. <laughs> <laughs> the noise of it. I, I honestly, I couldn't believe that because it was like it always been like a fifty dollar fine, and then they're like, "Yeah, it's fifty hours of community service." I'm like, "What the heck?" Wow. Was, they wanted to really crack down on college students making noise at night. Yeah. It didn't work. It went back to like fifty dollars <laughs> by the end of the year. Well, I wonder was, how many people weren't doing. The, the 50 and that hours. was so a lot of my roommates had this too and they being from new york state had friends of family that were police officers or friends that were in already young police officers they just had them sign off that they did it in their oh, hometown and gotcha. i'm like i i don't have that luxury that's <laughs> well you did, the right that. you did the right thing look at the story you have yeah look at the story you have cigarette butts i painted a a, a church inside oh, of yeah. like the rec room oh wow nice. yeah i did i did it, it was actually stuff that i could go home and like it, the big lesson I took away from it is I definitely don't want to get in, in more trouble and be like a lot of the other people that were doing that with yeah, me. Yeah, I did not want to hang out with those people much more than I had to. <laughs> so, great, yeah. great secret, Tom. Great secret. I love it. I love it. So that that probably wraps it up. I yeah, think we're yeah. That's good. it. With that, thank you, everyone. I'm Tom, and I am Fran. Thank you again, everyone, for tuning in. Uh, we'll see you next time. It will be a meet the guest. We don't have it finalized yet, but we will soon. So, uh, I, if it's who I think it's going to be, it will be a great episode. So make sure you tune in. Until then, keep it native. the native plants healthy planet podcast presented by pinelands nursery remember to like share follow and comment